Um, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Jillian Porter, and I'm an assistant professor of Russian at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to the Jordan Center for hosting this event. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Mark Lederman, who writes under the name of Mark Lipavetsky, and who has really shaped the field of late and post-Soviet literature and culture with some 10 books and many scores of articles, some single authored and some written in collaboration with others, and also through his very active editorial work and a term he recently served as the president of ATSEAL. His works have been nominated for the Russian Little Booker Prize and shortlisted for the Andrei Bieli Prize. And in 2014, he received an award for outstanding achievement from ATSEAL. Highlights from his list of publications include the books Russian Postmodernist Fiction, Dialogue with Chaos, Parologies, Transformation of Postmodernist Discourse in Russian Culture of the 1920s through 2000s, Performing Violence, Literary and Theatrical Experiments of New Russian Drama, which he co-authored with Bridget Boimers, um, Charms of Cynical Reason, the Transformations of the Trickster Trope in Soviet and Post-Soviet Culture, and Postmodern Crises, From Lolita to Pussy Riot. Um, as but one example of his recent collaborations, I'll just <laughs> hold up this 900-page history of Russian literature that he co-authored with Andrew Kahn, uh, Irina Raifman and Stephanie Sandler. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to manage on a crowded subway car, but it's well worth the effort. Uh, after about 20 years spent working at the University of Colorado, Professor Lederman has relocated this year to Columbia University, where he is professor of Slavic languages. Colorado's loss is certainly New York's gain, and so I'm sure you'll all be seeing more of him around town in the years ahead. But without further ado, I'll be glad to turn it over to Professor Lederman for his talk, Theology of Terror, Vladimir Sharov's Historiographic Metafiction. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you so very much. Uh, and thank you all for coming in this cold afternoon uh, to, to, to this lecture. I'm, I'm very impressed by, by, by the number of people and the quality of people coming here. Uh, so uh, before I begin, I want to to say that, that uh, Olga Dunayevska, Vladimir Sharov's wife, uh, guardian angel uh, associate is, is here with us. And therefore, if you have any questions uh, that that I cannot answer, she, she, she will answer them much better than I can do. Uh, also, um, the the, the, the text, the paper that I'm going to present uh, is uh, an article uh, that has been written for the uh, collection uh, of uh, essays and memoirs about Vladimir Sharov uh, that we are preparing uh, together with, with Anastasia de la Fartel uh, and Olya, who, who reads every, every piece uh, of text that being submitted to us, and even those that are not submitted yet, uh, before they are submitted, uh, for for NLO Press, uh, and it will be hopefully published, maybe by the end of 2020, maybe beginning 21. So you know how it is, but we will be working towards this, and uh, it will be the first uh, volume on uh, Vladimir Sharov. Um, and um, so I, I probably sit if, if, if you don't mind. Because this way I can control both text and, uh, and slides. Um, so, uh, an interesting thing happened with, with Vladimir Sharov. Um, during his lifetime, um, his uh, novels uh, famously caused scandals, as in 1993, when after the publication in Novy Mir of his novel Doi Vavremia, uh, before and during, uh, the two, two, two members of the editorial board published angry uh, reviews of this uh, novel within uh, uh, the magazine, which, which never happened before, probably the first thing, in, at least in, in Soviet practice. Um, then 
Um, his other novels were were, were rarely uh, well reviewed, uh, or they were reviewed sort of in in, in a, um, not not proper tone, I would say so. Uh, and uh, seemingly his his readership among critics was very not narrow. Although his readership uh, outside of professional literature was obviously growing, uh, which which, which uh, the publications and republications of his uh, novels testified to. However, when he when 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 he suddenly died in in, in uh, 2018, uh, the the publications uh, dedicated to to Valodia, uh, in one voice were saying that we lost a great writer. We lost a great writer. The, the, the title which, which nobody uh, dared to use towards him during his lifetime. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's sad and that's tragic, but uh, indeed we lost a great writer and uh, uh, it's necessary to, to understand what's his contribution to Russian culture and to Russian literature um, and to, to contemporary culture specifically. So. Um, you, you have main facts, if you can see, probably from the back row, you cannot. So I will be reading that. Uh, so so uh, Vladimir was, was born in the family of uh, a very well-known uh, Soviet writer, journalist, and, and author of extremely popular romantic fairy tales for children, Alexander Israelovich Sharov, known as Shera Sharov. And uh, if, if uh, you want to, to learn more about him, you, you, should, you should read his books. And uh, Vladimir's uh, memoir about his father, Kagdasherov uh, Formi. Um, he 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 wanted to be a historian, and he started. Uh, however, he didn't become a historian right away. He started studying at uh, Plikhanov Institute of Economics, but was expelled uh, very soon after the uh, attempt to organize a student strike. Uh, the things that were not very much encouraged uh, back then and not encouraged today as well. So, uh, and uh, so, so left, left, left without uh, any opportunity to study, Vladimir um, decided to continue his, his education in Voronezh. Um, and he, he was what, what was called in the Soviet time Zavochnik, right? And, but but he, he kept coming to Voronezh, and you may read a very interesting essay about Voronezh that he left there, he met there, uh, Natalia Stempel, who, who, who was one of the addresses of Mandelstam's poetry, and he met um, Alexander Nemirovsky, who became his mentor, a very prominent historian. There he, he found his uh, historical subject, Aprichnina, uh, about which he, he wrote his dissertation, and uh, uh, to which he returned to numerous times in his, in his essays, in his different uh, writings. For him, Aprichnina was indeed some kind of a prototypical event in, in Russian history. Uh, he started uh, he, he, the, 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 the first years of writing. Uh, the, the, they were difficult. He was looking for different genres. He was writing poetry. He was writing fairy tales. Um, and uh, Ola, correct me if, if, if I'm wrong. Uh, he, he found the, the genre of the novel only in the late 70s and started writing it in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, the first novel is titled. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, Sliat uh, Sliat, uh, and it, it is uh, of course published and even republished now, and uh, even more so, you can you can easily download an audio book of this novel uh, if if you want. And this novel is quite curious because on the one hand it is not yet Sharov's novel because it has different intonations and different sort of um, kinds of narrative uh, present there. On the other hand, it contains very many future discoveries that will later unfold in his in his uh, in his novels right uh, but uh, be before i talk about about novels more specifically um i want to 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 give this this uh, quotation from uh, his interview dasha would you please sit i'm I, I, i'm troubled that you're standing up uh, <laughs> hello there's a chair up front if you want uh, so, uh, in, the, in, in the interview that will appear in uh, uh, this volume that I mentioned, there is an uh, interview given to a Bulgarian writer, Georgi Borisov. Uh, Volodya uh, recollects his childhood. 
and it's my translation, so so please please forgive me for for mistakes with articles or what's not. Uh, we've got a one-family apartment in 1957 when father's friends had been returning from Gulag. The dinner table stayed covered. Guests slept in our apartment by six, by seven. I was growing among these people. I was a child terrorist who stayed awake until 2 a.m., participating in adult conversations and treating my father's friends as my own bodies. Some of them spent 15 or 20 years in Gulag. This was my learning environment, my education, my basis, if you will. Uh, people who went through most terrifying things and survived, they preserved immense amount of optimism, eagerness to live and live further. It was impossible to return without this energy. Um, so, so he, Vladimir was born in 1952, so, and the, the starting point, 57, so he was five years plus, and that was his really foundational experience. The, the stories about concentration camps, this, these images of people who survived them and who, who continued to live, who, who uh, by their inner strength could, could get through all these horrors. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it will be an exaggeration that, that uh, this, this memoir explains, uh, um, along with other things of course, why uh, his every work, his every uh, novel, and mainly he was writing novels and essays, uh, uh, returns and uh, basically is centered around uh, the Bolshevik terror, Chika and Kavada, Gulag. The, the, these themes reappear uh, in his novels uh, with, with some kind of mathematic inevitability. He, he may start in, in, in 17th century, he may start in 19th century, but whatever happens, it will come to, to, to that point. So basically, basically he um, uh, constantly tries to provide the explanation, if not justification, for, for the great term, for the great term. And I, I, I'll return to this, to this issue. Uh, however, uh, this, this very much historical uh, orientation, very much historical without any inverted commas, uh, and as I said, he was a historian by, by training, in, uh, does not uh, translate into his plots, which are uh, extremely fantastic. So, so, so the paradox of, of Vladimir's prose is that he writes in the most uh, mm, documentary way absolutely fantastic stories. Right. Uh, in Doi uh, Vavrieme, before and during, for instance, he, he writes the story of Three Lies of Madame de Stal. Of course, Madame de Stal is a historical character. We, we know about her years in Russia, but we, we never could uh, fathom that, that she would uh, know the secret of ancient Jews and uh, could, could give birth to herself three times uh, uh, and therefore live through the entire two centuries and uh, basically form uh, through her sexuality the entire Russian Revolution to the point that Stalin was not only her lover, we can buy it, right, but also her son. That's why he's Stalin. <laughs> he's the son of Madame de Stal. Right, so he, he took his pseudonym not from Stilf but from Stal. Right, um, um, in the novel, I'm giving just, just a few examples, I'm not going to retell all, all nine novels. Um, in, in the novel, uh, the old girl, Stara Idevachka, uh, Vera Radestiva, uh, shocked by, by, by the great terror, shocked by the arrest and death of her husband, decides to go back in time. Uh, and she does this, uh, she can do this, because she was uh, writing a very detailed, uh, detailed diary throughout her life. And so she lives every day in the reverse order, following her diary as a script. And suddenly the entire uh, NKVD, entire Communist Party, and Stalin, who was a part of her life in the past, are worrying where Vera is going. Uh, and where is she, she, she's going to stop? Stalin has uh, an idea that uh, she is going to him, uh, and uh, the, she's going to the moment when they could have become lovers, but didn't because she told him that he is God. He, she cannot sleep with God, right? Uh, but, and uh, the entire novel is built around this this absolutely fantastic, but but presented in the most realist way as something extremely natural fact that she goes back in time. 
And at first, uh, we think, okay, it's a metaphor. Then, then when all this hassle uh, builds up around it, it you start to uh, suspect that she is not uh, moving metaphorically. She is moving more than metaphorically. And in the end of the novel, we see uh, a little girl, and uh, soon we understand who meets the uh, narrator, who looks very much like Vladimir Sharov. And this happens in 1956, right? And uh, we suddenly understand that that's indeed Vera, who went back in her life and reached her childhood. Now she's in 1956. She's 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 a child. Of course, the the allegorical meaning here is quite quite prominent as well. Vera, faith, radostiva, uh, joy, right? So so uh, all this enthusiasm and faith uh, that that were accompanying revolution, they they are sort of diminishing and going back in time, right? Or sort of belittling literally uh, but but these allegorical meanings are, are hidden very 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 f deeply in the uh, structure of the text and it, it, it takes time before you understand that that it may be read this way but it may not be read this way right? uh, surprisingly or not uh, Vladimir very rarely provides any kind of explanation or any kinds at least of convention to, to, to swallow this, this fantastic events that are happening there, right? Um, the, the story about Madame de Stal, who knew the secret of financial Jews, is an exception there. In the majority of cases, nothing is explained. As, by the way, in this very, very first uh, novel, Sliad uh, Sliad, where it begins that, that uh, there is a woman who, who has a child, but, but she imagined that she has two other children to other uh, boys, right? And uh, her, her child, her son, sort of pretends to be these this other boys in order to please uh, her mother. And then, then we read the novel and we read the stories of three men, three different men, and these stories go in different directions. And we can understand if these stories are the stories of the same men, it cannot be because they die different lives, live different lives and die different death, right? Uh, or it's j just uh, imaginary figments of of uh, the mother's imagination took took uh, flash and started living their their own own lives, right? So so th these are just examples. Uh, but what what is important uh, to emphasize that um, Sharov always places. Russia and all these novels are about Russia uh, into the uh, religious, even biblical context. Right? Um, he he argues, and by his novels he proves it quite quite uh, diligently that the sacred scripture directly relates to Russia's history and its present. In the same interview that I have already quoted, uh, he said. Russian history is totally religious. It always attempts to repeat biblical history in its significant and even insignificant details. This concerns the whole country and every individual alike. However, uh, so of course, biblical history suggests interactions with God. However, God, with whom um, interact Sharov's characters, is a modernist God. It's not. It's not exactly a biblical God. It's a very weak. Um, indecisive, uh, hesitating God. I, I would say that it, uh, it's, it's a survival of his own death. It's God's survival of his own death. He knows about this. And he knows that, that, that people are doubtful about, about his existence. And he's doubtful about his power as well. Um, although though we never see God, we never hear the God's word, uh, we always sort of participate or um, observe the dialogue where we hear only one side of this dialogue. But we, uh, the, the, those who are in dialogue with God, they, they sort of constantly reconstruct what God thinks, wants, hesitates about, etc., etc., etc. But I would even say that the weakness of God increases uh, in, in Vladimir's novels, uh, if uh, in his uh, f second novel, uh, Rehearsals, uh, 1992, uh, the, the year of publication, um, one of the characters is sort of irritated by his uh, sort of comrade attitude uh, to God as weak, uh, as, a, as a helpless old man or a child who doesn't understand things. Right? So, 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 so people treat God as a helpless child, right? Uh, in the last novel uh, that, that, that uh, Vladimir saw published weeks before, before his tragic death, uh, uh, 
God is already uh, given up. Uh, God not just left, God gave up the human world to, to Antichrist. Sort of, and and uh, sort of the task of the central character is to sort of lure God back and prove him that, you know, you may you may take us back. We we are not we are not that bad, right? Um, so the, 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 these are the premises, sort of the, the, the biblical biblical situations that are coming along, uh, uh, are being repeated. Uh, as uh, in this sense, uh, his his second novel rehearsal that I mentioned is very paradigmatic because there in in the seventeenth century under the. Um, Will of uh, Patriarch Nikon, uh, the French actor Sertan is being invited in order to reenact biblical sins with Christ, right? And why, why reenact? Because of course uh, Nikon builds a new Jerusalem. So if it's new Jerusalem, which imitates old Jerusalem, there should be of course sins uh, from Gospels. And here are Jews, here are Romans. Uh, uh, everybody knows. His or her part, there is only no 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 Christ, and they have to 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 live these sins as deeply as possible, with the hope that if they do it right, Christ will will come, Christ will show up, and and these rehearsals they go through centuries and end up guess where of course in the concentration camp in Gulag, right? So so that that's where everything ends. So basically that that's as I said a paradigmatic model for all uh, Sharov's novels because they're all sort of rehearsals. They all sort of repeat these sins, but but God is not there. God never never comes, right? And that's that's um, the problem. But if we accept this premise, we understand that these novels are not fantastic. They're very realistic. They're extremely realistic, sometimes even naturalistic, right? Uh, and that's what what uh, Vladimir argued. He he didn't like when his novels were called uh, postmodernist novels, which I'm going to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't like when they were called alternative history. Uh, his uh, argument was that it is history, but it is history on a deep level. Uh, history, as we may say now in jargon, on the discursive level. That that's how it happens on the level of intellectual interactions. And I'm just materializing the, the history of ideas in the history of, of my characters. But basically it is history of ideas being played out as as uh, the drama. Besides he he emphasized that uh uh tamu što pišu vjeru. many writers would say this when writing uh, I believe in what I am writing. Right, but but uh, I, I believe that Vladimir wanted to emphasize the, the sort of the verisimilitude uh, within the text existed for him as very mm, tangible factor. Right? However, um, in in at the same time and from from my perspective, his novels uh, fall uh, perfectly into Linda Hutchins' definition of historiographic metafiction. Right, so sort of novels uh, that uh, depict the ways history is being created, the, uh, the ways history is being constructed as more or less uh, fictional text, right? Um, and uh, uh, Vladimir only pushes this, the, 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 this premise to, to its most fantastic uh, materialization, but uh, he writes novels about writing history, right? And uh, that's, that's uh, what we have to keep in mind. However, as I said, um, all these novels uh, turn around terror and provide what might be even taken for the justifications of terror. And, and I will talk about the justifications in a minute. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, uh, as I said, he was, he was writing novels. You can, you can see covers of his old nine novels uh, and uh, two books of essays. Um, and in essays, Iskushenie Revolutsii Perikrosnoe Polenie, 2009 and 2018, um, essays quite, quite directly uh, articulate uh, the, the narratives which create the frame for his novels. Narratives that, that provide some kind of meta 
explanation from his standpoint of Russian history. Um, and this explanation is defined as pro providentialism, right? Um, so, uh, in, um, in the, the, the latter book, uh, Cross Pollination, Pericross Napolini, uh, there is his letter to uh, Alexander Etkind about his book, uh, Internal Colonization, where he basically says that, okay, that's fine, all these economic factors, but you are not taking into consideration this factor, providentialism, right? That Russian history is always providential. It's well known in this teaching, uh, nothing is accidental and everything is his, from capital H, doing. If you are sinful with inevitability, you should wait for natural catastrophes, famine, freeze, and other penalties. But if we are blessed, and by this are distinct from other peoples, whatever they say about us, whatever blame us for, he is placed by us. Based on the same principle, we are the country of faith and also the country with an unbreakable conviction in its righteousness. Our righteousness is Lord's righteousness. And after that he has this phrase, one has to apply some effort in order to disagree with this logic. Right, uh, so, 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 so he, he, he obviously gets carried away as he does in his novels, but, but then he takes a step back. One has to take, uh, to apply some effort, to take some effort, to, you know, to disagree with this logic. And I, I want us to, to remember this phrase because uh, there is a huge temptation to to equate uh, Vladimir with, with, with these narratives, uh, which he subscribed to in his essay, right? But I, I believe that his novels, they, they, they contain this effort to, to, to disagree with this notion. Uh, what, is, what is especially amazing about uh, Vladimir's novels is that they, in many ways, foreshadow uh, what appeared uh, in such famous, uh, or at least well-known, historical studies as Alexander Atkins' Clist, 1997, and uh, uh, recently in uh, uh, Yuri Slyoskin's uh, The House of uh, the Government. So basically, they're, 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 they're detecting uh, the millenarist uh, narrative, the mi millenarist uh, discourse behind Russian revolution. Uh, Vladimir was doing this since his very first novel, written in in the in the 80s, and uh, the resonance between between his writings and and their writings is immense. With of course a big difference that he is not writing uh, a historical study; he is writing novels, right? And uh, um, another 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 big uh, difference uh, is. Uh, that, that uh, both Atkin uh, and uh, Slyoskin, to a different extent, um, explore how millenarism interacts with, with uh, discourses born within the Enlightenment, or so derivative of Enlightenment, discourses of rationality, emancipation, etc., etc., so, which creates a, a, a complex fabric of Russian Revolution and post-revolution. Uh, Vladimir, on the contrary, he can completely dis uh, subtracts, I would say, everything associated with rationality uh, and uh, enlightenment uh, themes, etc. And he creates a sort of a laboratory examples of the manifestations and embodiments of this millenarist uh, discourse that, that basically suggests the birth of the new world, the new order, the new life through the catastrophe, through the apocalyptic, eschatological ordeal. Right. Um, so, uh, what, what in essays sounds sometimes as, as uh, dogmatic uh, and uh, as um, questionable statements, sort of, which we, we do not take into consideration, uh, multiple factors in novels is absolutely convincing. First of all, because it is associated with the mindset of characters, and uh, um, uh, it is a very important uh, quality of Vladimir's uh, novels that that he moves from one narrator to another. The, the, basically, his his uh, novels are labyrinth uh, at each turn of which stands another narrator and leads to another story and then to another story and then to another story. And some of these uh, stories are dead ends, but then, then we come back to another narrator and, and, and all starts over. Uh, and I'll explain why, why he is doing this. Uh, but 
basically, basically, uh, this this uh, the, although the narrative is basically the same, and the voices of narrators are not uh, very much different in terms of their their style. We cannot say that there are different different voices. There are different subjects, but not different voices. However, uh, the notes provide. Uh, mm, deliver this narrative in the most ambivalent way. Uh, they, 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 they make it internally contradictory and they make it uh, very funny sometimes. And I just, I just, uh, let's, let's skip this. Um, for instance, the, 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 the fragment from um, Before and During, translated by Oliver Reddy, on the basis uh, of uh, the expectations of the second coming, of course. There can be only one basis. Uh, two programs were developed for Russia by the end of the century, which in line with current fashion were called the minimum program and the maximum program. In reality, they were simply different stages of one and the same program, whose ultimate aim was to return by the efforts of man, not God, of all humankind to heaven and its union with the Lord. To this end, the common program envisioned the resurrection of all the dead, beginning with Adam, as well as the endowment of personal immortality, eternal youth, and the fullness of happiness for each and every man. So, so, so the, the, uh, he, he, I don't know if in English it, it, it's as obvious as in Russian, but uh, there is a clash of two, two languages, right? One is the uh, Soviet-speak, the, the, this bureaucratic Marxist party language about programma maximum, programma minimum, right? uh, which every school, school child in the Soviet Union was supposed to learn more or less by heart by, by, by the eighth year in school. Uh, and uh, but, but this program, minimum, program, maximum, they concern, as you can see, the union with the Lord, uh, resurrection of all the dead, uh, uh, beginning with Adam uh, and uh, eternal youth and fullness of happiness. So here comes the biblical discourse. Soviet bureaucratic uh, language and biblical discourse come together and they, they create a cocktail which which I I believe is extremely funny. It's, it's comedic, it's satirical, but but at the same time it, it it is the very much serious narrative that as as I repeat over and over develops in in in, in this in this novel, right? Uh, um, here in this example I, I brought it up because I think that they it, it testifies to to the grotesque as a very important part. Of uh, Vladimir's uh, style and gr grotesque, as Yuri Tinyanov teaches us, is based on what he calls in Russian nivyaska. Uh, Ainsley Morris and Philip Ritko translated it as a discrepancy between the two levels. So, so there is a parody here, right? A parody and grotesque uh, discrepancy between the two levels. Uh, they that they be shifted. The parody of a tragedy will be a comedy. Um, and a parody of a comedy can be a tragedy. So, so that's exactly what we see in, in Vladimir's uh, novels. But here we don't uh, are not dealing with, with parodia, but with what Tenyanov calls parodichness, the application of parodic form to serve a non-parodic function. Uh, I'm sorry, there's something, some 2 a.m. writing, I'm sorry. Uh, don't pay attention to this. Uh, <coughs> so what, what produces this discrepancy between the two levels? What are these two levels? So. Here, here we can see in, 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 in the style of the text, uh, I already um, indicated two levels, sort of, the uh, political uh, and uh, religious. But for Vladimir, it's, it's basically the coexistence of secular and religious levels uh, in, in uh, Russian life and in Russian history. And coexistence of parallel um, realms associated with uh, centered around religious discourse, centered around secular discourse, and uh, parallel interpretations that coexist in, in history. But he brings them together. He brings them uh, next to each other, and they, 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 they are conflated, and at the same time, they are quarreling with each other and creating these this, this sparkles and these effects of, of grottos. Um, also, I, th I, I, th I think there is, th there is another level here, which we may um, again uh, associate with his biography. And um, in Pirkos Napilinia, he, he writes about his family. My grandmother from one side and my grandfather from another side were executed by Bolsheviks. Uh, they were f f from the Bund. 
Uh, one more grandfather died in prison and the single grandmother that I knew spent five years in the labor camp for the traitor's wives. As a result, I could imagine only fragmentary the history of my family and first 40 years of Soviet history. A whole, a whole picture failed to appear. From what I heard followed that this was a life like any other. People loved each other and had children, worked hard, wrote hundreds of outstanding books and made an un unaccountable number of discoveries. This was life for which they, when necessary, would die. And nearby, or rather within this very life, between loves, children and work, they were standing in endless lines to Lubyanka, hoping to send a parcel to Gulag with food and warm clothing, which, with some luck, could help a close one to survive. Uh, and that, that, that's another discrepancy, that's another niviask, right? Uh, the, the world of uh, warm domesticity and uh, for Vladimir, uh, the, the world of the family, the, the belonging to, to extended family is a very important uh, part of, of selfhood, right? Uh, and the, 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 the presence of hell right there. Right there. Not, 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 not um, even in a parallel course, but, but completely interwoven, not, not even separate, right there. And, and this, the, the, this probably the, is the, this existential feeling, this, as we would now say, post-memory that, 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 that drives uh, his style and uh, makes him, returns him to, to, to the subject of the Great Terror or over and over again as the highest manifestation of this inseparability of, of home, warmth, love, uh, fulfillment, and, and, and uh, horror, and historical horror. Right? So, uh, n now I would like very briefly, because, because I'm already talking for, for 30 minutes, um, to, 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 to just uh, define uh, main, main, main themes that constitute this, this meta-narrative, uh, which, which all of his novels are uh, dealing with. Right? So, the, the, the first thesis uh, is, is very much traditional, right? It's, uh, and he uh, directly refers to monk Philophus, uh, right? Philophus, how they pronounce it. Uh, and uh, the, the, the tale of uh, uh, the princess of Vladimir, where, where the doctrine of Moscow as the third Rome is formulated. However, he, as, as uh, Carol also writes about this, uh, for him it was uh, less a third Rome. Uh, and more Second Jerusalem, which of course emphasizes again the, the, the rehearsal, the repetition of uh, uh, biblical history, right? Uh, but the, the, the idea of the chosen people projected on, on Russia and uh, the Russian people, uh, for him also suggests a very uh, peculiar concept of power, which is at the same time, more or less timeless and very much much timed. Uh, he he argued, uh, for example, that that in Russia, since uh, the Tsar, the monarch, is the mediator between God and the chosen people, uh, the indications of God's love to the people are more important than than competence or incompetence of the government, right? And therefore, any sense of corruption, any bad management would not be taken into consideration in comparison with natural calamities. Natural calamities can end the regime. Why? Because they show that God doesn't like us anymore. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if, if it was so, but, but I, I couldn't help thinking about Gorbachev and uh, Chernobyl and all these calamities that sort of ended the Soviet, the Soviet regime, showing that, that the God doesn't like us anymore. Right? And uh, at the same time, his, his other point is that, that uh, the, the responsibility of the Russian uh, leader is uh, to, to find the way to God, and that's why all Russian revolutions are mainly revolutions from the above. Again, uh, th th this is very very direct uh, reflection of the immediate experience that, that Vladimir, as, as well as our entire generation, had uh, during perestroika and, and the, following, the following years. Uh, a revolution as the attempt to, 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 to bring uh, the second coming. That's, that's another very, very important theme. It's what makes this uh, narrative millenarist, right? Um, and um, for, for uh, Sharov, the very 
critical figure in this uh, aspect of the historical meta narrative uh, was Nikolai Fyodorov. He, he constantly returns to Nikolai Fyodorov and um, in this or that way, and Nikolai Fyodorov appears as a character in uh, before and during. However, he appears as a very, very funny character and uh, very helpless character. And basically, uh, Vladimir's argument is that uh, it was Madame de Stal who actually made Fyodorov who who he became, right? And actually, it was Madame de Stal who was uh, reenacting some some strange uh, sexual um, games with uh, with him, um, made him dream about the resurrection of the dead, right? Um, but never, nevertheless, uh, Fyodorov for, for, for Sharov is indeed the critical figure because, as he argues elsewhere, he made uh, sort of he, he argued that Fyodorov has transformed Russian eschatology. He made it very optimistic. In which, how can one make up uh, eschatology optimistic? He said that we don't have to wait for God to end our world and to come back, right? We can do it ourselves. So do it yourself, basically, right? Uh, apocalypse is uh, the, 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 do it yourself. Um, the man can uh, by himself and today now destroy this sinful uh, world in which he lives and build the paradise on earth. For, furthermore, he may and also by himself without waiting for the savior to begin the resurrection of everyone living on earth. And of course, here we see the direct reference to, to Fyodorov, right? Um, in in uh, Doi Vavrimov, for the, for the first time probably, uh, we see that there's a direct connection between uh, Fyodorov's idea of the resurrection of the dead and the Great Terror, because in the novel, uh, Madame de Stal constantly tries to convince Stalin to start to start terror, and Stalin sort of resists, and, and she tries to provoke him by, by sleeping with all uh, leading Bolsheviks and sort of exciting his jealousy. He, he follows, but he's too good of a man to to kill them all. So, 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 so uh, and then uh, there, there follows this scene that day, which is the first of May, which is maybe important. Uh, she, Madame de Stal, told him, Stalin, that the death experienced by those killed on his orders was not a real death, but a sort of a mock death, like in a fairy tale. When communism finally arrived and the dead would no longer be an impediment to anyone, then, just as her teacher further refused to tell her, they would all be returned, resurrected, raised from the ashes. They would fall out of non-existence into a world more beautiful than any that had ever existed on earth, a world of happiness and harmony, eternal youth and beauty, love and joy. They would return to the paradise from which Adam was once expelled for his sins, the paradise they continued to dream about generation after generation. That May Day conversation determined the fate of the country. After it, Joseph Stalin finally became the real Stalin, the Stalin we all know. Right, so, so uh, Fyodor here, uh, Fyodor's logic becomes uh, quite, quite important. Uh, the, but the next step, inter interconnected. Uh, with this one, and uh, in many ways, uh, sort of not so much contradicting uh, Christian doctrine, is uh, the thesis about salvation through 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 suffering, which in uh, Sharov's translations sounds as salvation through violence and the terror. Right uh, in the same novel, and uh, I'm citing uh, before and during so much because a that was the novel where the the narrative for the first time came together. And B, it is brilliantly translated by Oliver Reddy, and I would rather use his translations than than my handmade uh, exercises. Right. Um, so in this in, in this novel, um, there appears this this group Avro, that uh, whose goal is to produce as many geniuses as possible. But but uh, the, their main premise is that geniuses are produced by catastrophes. So they have to produce catastrophes first, then they will be geniuses, right? Uh, and uh, here is the justification. People have to pass through unthinkable suffering, or they can never be purified and resurrected. Calamities and grief have to drive them insane, all of them, to the last man. And only then will they make a clean break with their former life. Only then will their souls be freed. We will be so filled with freedom that however small the abilities of any man among us, he too will become a genius and as such open himself to God. 
man for the first time will see his true majesty and beauty, the perfection of the world he created, and seeing it will return to God. Yes, that's exactly how it was all meant to be, said Ephraim. Uh, what it means um, in, 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 in practice, in, in other novels, is, um, for example, in Vaskreshenia Lazare, uh, he, he, he comes to the, to the, uh, to the idea that um, all interrogations, all tortures uh, that people were undergoing through, uh, during the terror were collection of the material for the future resurrection. And uh, the, the, as we all know, the, the stamp on the files Hranik Vichna, ha, ve, is the same as Christos Vaskresia, not by an accident. It's sort of the, the program for the resurrection. So the torturers were at the same time the future resurrectors. Right? Uh, uh, even more dramatically, even more dramatically, this uh, motif uh, develops in, in, in Vladimir's last novel, Tsarstva Agamemnona. Um, its, its central character, Zhustovsky, is a very complicated character. On the one hand, he is uh, uh, an imposter who pretends to be Mikhail Romanov and sort of travels across Russia as Mikhail Romanov. On the other hand, he is uh, he, he's a priest. He, he's a priest of the Russian Orthodox Church and also uh, he spends years and years in uh, Gulag uh, becoming the the teacher and uh, the sort of the light for many prisoners. But at the same time, as we learned very early in the course of the novel, he constantly informs on everyone he knows, including his own daughter, by the way. Uh, and that we learn it from his daughter, who, who has to rewrite his, his, his danos. Uh, and he does this methodically, and it's not an innocent thing because people are not just arrested, they're, 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 they're killed, they're tortured, they're, they perish, etc., etc. But uh, Zhustovsky believes that, that that's a part of the huge plan. What plan? The plan of uh, production of uh, saints and martyrs who will come to God, right, and they will pray for Russia. And they will convince to return to Russia and then take it back away from the Antichrist. What happens when they are murdered, as my father, and responded himself? The heaven receives more martyrs and sufferers, more saints and righteous ones. And they all together pray for the holy land and for the people long time ago chosen by God, but now abandoned by him. Their chorus flies to the Savior with a plea to return and to punish the Antichrist and to take under his wing the people which he once chose. And later on, uh, in 20 years, the Russian church, another character says, uh, acquired more martyrs than the Roman church in 20 centuries. It's, it's, it's a very perverted logic, but it is very much derivative of this uh, idea that, that uh, suffering slash torture slash violence are the path to salvation. All right. Um, uh, finally, uh, in this narrative, a very important role belongs to, uh, to mediators. Mediators between the people, the chosen people, of course, and God, who who has to uh, sort of follow their their desires in many ways. So, and this, these mediators are different. Uh, f typically, typically they are either artists, like Sirtan in in rehearsals, uh, like in a certain way she is an artist, Madame de Stal in. Uh, before and during, uh, like Gogol uh, in uh, the novel uh, Return to, to, to Egypt, uh, um, and I, I think that the paradigmatic kind of uh, mediator of this kind is the chorus director Liptagov in the novel Nieli ne Pajolie, uh, who, who uh, conducts the chorus, right, and this chorus basically speaks with God. So the, it, it, it's a constant communication, and uh, this conversation with God by the means of course determines uh, Bolsheviks' policy, its turns and changes, including, for instance, the, 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 the mass repentance of party before the people that happens around the late 30s, as uh, it happens in this novel, and, and, and many, many other things. Um, sometimes they, they, these are priests, but, but not, not uh, 
um, sort of stable priests, but priests who are wandering across uh, country, priests in this uh, in this stage of pilgrimage, right? These uh, uh, protagonists in in Vaskreshenia Lazaria and uh, Kormchi in again uh, Vaskreshenia Vigipi, right? Uh, but they, they, they constantly negotiate with God. And then they, they, they pass their messages, God's messages, by, by different channels, to the political leaders, political figures. And here we see a very strange, strange transformation of these political leaders. We, we, we find uh, something that, that uh, may be even defined as apology of Stalin. Stalin is suddenly defined as, as a very sweet and nice character. Who, who does all best, all, all he can do um, uh, to, 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 to uh, accomplish what he has to do, right? Uh, he was a very good man, very kind and slightly sentimental man. Needless to say, he was better than everyone around him, but for the party of that time, the country of that time, kindness was not a blessing, but a curse. There was nothing she could do, she, Madame de Stel. Jealousy alone could liberate him, jealousy alone gave him strength, but she could hardly go and sleep with half of the country. Uh, another character uh, in the same novel says that Stalin is basically a fiction, that Stalin is just, just a, a product of, of people's imagination, because Stalin is just the the tool of this meta-narrative, of this millenarist uh, narrative, and therefore Stalin as a character is not to blame to. He is just a vehicle, he is just a channel, right? With Lenin it's even funnier, because uh, Sharov has the novel about Lenin, Butti uh, Kagdeti, where he focuses on the uh, last days of Lenin, when Lenin is slipping into dementia, and uh, he argues that, that the, 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 this time, uh, this period, when Lenin uh, seemingly is losing his mind, which in Russian is Padayat Vnetstva, is indeed the time when, when, when he undergoes epiphany. Because there he understands what is true communism. True communism is return to childhood. And he organizes, while in this uh, semi-conscious state, the, the uh, children's crusade uh, of, of homeless children who are walking towards Jerusalem to, again, of course, bring Christ back and create the, the second coming, right? And uh, he, he, I, I won't be reading the, this quote. Um, so there, there is one, one other moment that, 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 that sort of uh, brings all these elements together is uh, the symmetry between the terror and sacred rites. Mm -hmm. Czechists appear as some kind of priests. And Rostovsky, the protagonist of uh, the last novel, says that uh, um, confession is the same whether it happens in the church or under interrogation. The, the, the euphoria that follows the confession is of the same nature. And therefore, we and Czechists are doing the same work, right? And uh, especially, especially uh, sarcastic and sardonic in this respect is Vaskrishenia Lazaria, where, for example, we can find another example of this mixture of bureaucratic and religious style. It's everywhere, but here it's quite telling. Above the head of the original NKVD pointed towards the sky with his finger. They adopted and, and above, we don't send above whether on heaven or in, in high apparatus of, of the part of NKVD. They adopted a principal resolution to accept our judgment as equivalent to the last judgment. And accordingly, without any exception, to remunerate the suffering accepted by prisoners from us. They won't be suffering anymore. Hell is over for them forever. They will receive only resurrection and eternal life. So, so on the one hand, we are saying that NKVD is hell. Literally, right? On the other hand, yeah, so that's, that, that's it. There will be no more hell, only paradise. So last judgment has already happened. The, 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 the NKVD interrogators are the officers of, of God, right? Um, and uh, how, how much time do you have? Okay, I, 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 you don't know, I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> so so, so the, 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 this narrative can, can, can go uh, we can go in more in more um, detail or less detail, but but I want to, to emphasize that that mm -hmm. it's being constructed and deconstructed at the same time. Mm -hmm. And one of the main main means of deconstruction is the form of the dimensional uh, narratives. Here it is important to notice that that for him um, the revolution was the 
um, radical, radical uh, form of simplification of life. He calls the returns to, to, to the theme that, that people were too tired of the too adult life and they wanted to make it simple. They wanted to return to childhood. Right, that's why Bhutti Kagdeti be like children, right? And uh, he calls the rise that, that the enthusiasm and, and some kind of naivete that, 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 that everyone who reads from and about the 1920s is the result of this, of this return to, to, to simplicity. For him, the, the sensation came to him when he first uh, read Platonov's uh, Foundation Pit. And for him, Platonov is the prototypical figure here who at the same time reconstructs this, this naivete and at the same time provides its deconstruction as well. So he, he in many ways, tries to follow uh, mm -hmm. Platonov's footsteps. But that's where, where uh, the, um, the form of his novels becomes so important. All critics, everybody who, who, who reads uh, Sharov, feels the complexity of his form, and, and I already mentioned it, this, this labyrinth of narrative, this, this chain of, uh, of narrators, uh, add to this that there is no uh, dialogues, uh, that, that his sentences never end, right, and that they last for very lengthy paragraphs, and uh, that um, his endings are never completed, that they have opened and or anticlimactic, right? There are very, very few uh, exceptions, but even even when the flood happens, it, it 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 is perceived or presented as some kind of long snowfall. Um, but it is flood, as we understand. And uh, the the, the uh, powerful allegorical meanings they are hidden on the deep level of the text. They they are not flashy. As I said, you have to step back before before you feel the power of this text. But I think that, that that's that's the point of his notes. He makes he returns us to complexity. He shows that 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 that, that the oversimplification is a huge temptation, but it is a misleading temptation, right? And if the meta narrative or this millionaireist uh, meta narrative provides the oversimplification, he sort of makes it complex again. He 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 turns it around and shows that there is a that that that. Uh, uh, simplicity is a delusion, not even an illusion. Delusion, right? Which which leads to to to, to seas of blood and and uh, endless endless suffering. But th th there are other things. For instance, um, his his uh, ideologues always speak about collective borders, about the people. But uh, in each of his novels, we have a very very powerful sense of. Uh, individual sexuality, very much individualized, never, never collective, never collective ecstasy. Um, they speak about uh, the people and he speaks about detailed biographies going in the um, elements that, 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 that or oh, elements, so sort of terms of biographies that do not have direct relation to the main narrative. They're, they are meaningless, but they're important because they create this individual life, individual story, individual narrative that is completely outside of the of the grand narrative. Um, the, the, this logic about the chosen people who become even more chosen or confirm their, their role of the chosen people by undergoing through um, suffering and uh, the terror uh, is uh, repeated uh, is, um, Sharov constantly sort of turns to, to, to the thought that so who would survive as a result of this unnatural selections? Executioners only. The survivors will be executioners. And here I see a, a very um, sort of interesting uh, parallel to Benjamin's famous thesis about history that's being written from the standpoint of victors rather than of uh, losers, uh, for, for, for Sharov, uh, history is written from the standpoint of executioners, uh, not, just, not just victors, right? Um, furthermore, uh, even, even this, this, this uh, thesis about salvation through the terror, uh, Sharov frequently transforms into something different, into the narrative of salvation that needs to be created in order to, to let people bear incredible, unimaginable suffering that they have to live through. Because the, the, the worst thing for them is to know that this suffering is for nothing. This suffering is absurd. Right? And uh, uh, his ideologues like Zhostovsky, they give people the, the, the feeling of meaningfulness, which, which makes them go through. Right? But 
if this meaning is indeed there or not is quite questionable. And Rostovsky, along with being the, this uh, sort of powerful, even prophetic figure, he's also a trickster, he's also a manipulator, right? Uh, he, he, he plays uh, people and uh, his, his ambiguity is quite uh, prominent there. He's probably the most ambiguous of his, of his uh, protagonists. Some of his um, some of his uh, novels um, contain performative critique of uh, the main elements of this narrative. For instance, this idea of Czechists as as uh, resurrectors uh, in Vaskreshenie Lazar is transformed in the depiction of the right how the family of the person who had been tortured to death by the Czechist adopts this Czechist as the member of the family because uh, and uh, this Czechist is adopted before his or her death by the person because it is the Czechist who is responsible for the resurrection, the resurrection of fathers. So the Czechist becomes the member of the family. Uh, executions before their fathers resurrect their victims. During the investigation, the latter adopt uh, their torturers and, as their sons, so they will have a full right to resurrect them when the time comes. In this, I said, I say a great act of forgiveness in re reconciliation. In any case, executions during their lifetime become heirs to their victims having their property, wives, and glory. But now it turns out that all this happens for the sake of a victim, so that they could live forever. Right? So it, 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 is, it, is, it is quite, quite brutal, I would say. It's not, it's not uh, irony. It's, it's, it's uh, sarcasm. Right? Um, so, uh, and, and of course, I, I can bring more more examples, uh, but most importantly, all these sort of elements of deconstruction, they come together into a counter-narrative, which uh, I would define following uh, Vladimir's lead uh, as the counter-narrative of man's judgment upon God, right? Uh, and in Vaskreshenie uh, Lazare, we read, the last judgment exists, and it's even more fearsome than you may think. And more terrifying than Apostle John thought God forgive him, because at the last judgment, it's not God who judges man, but man who judges God. Uh, what, what what it means? It, it basically means that that the uh, not only millenarianism, right, but also the striving for the transcendental, the striving for metaphysics, appears as the ultimate source of violence and terror. Right, and uh, the, 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 this is the conclusion to which uh, Vladimir's novels uh, lead. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, we, we all, at least I was puzzled for, for many years by Benjamin's famous critique of violence with his definition of sovereign violence as the revolutionary violence, right, as the divine violence, which is the sign and seal, but never the means of sacred execution may be called sovereign violence. Revolutionary violence, the highest manifestation of unalloyed violence by man possible. That's exactly what Sharov depicts, sovereign violence, which, which sort of directly stems from the desire to get the unity with God, right? And uh, that's, that, that's quite a dramatic conclusion, maybe uh, one-sided. And I, I understand that it is one-sided because despite this, this profound critique of metaphysics, his novels remain metaphysical nevertheless, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, he, he basically creates uh, some oxymoronic uh, postmodernist uh, metaphysics of Russian history. Nobody else could create it. Uh, where does it reside? I don't know, but, but uh, I, I would uh, cover myself with a quotation from Agamben, whom else? Agamben is always our friend, right, um, and uh, in Profanations, uh, in uh, the chapter on parody, he writes, one can say that parody is the theory and practice of that in language and being which beside itself, or the being beside itself, of every being and every discourse. Just as metaphysics is impossible, at least for modern thought, except as the parodic opening of a space alongside sensible experience, parody is a notoriously impractical practicable terrain in which the traveler constantly knocks against limits and a porous that he can't avoid, but that he also can't escape. So, so Vladimir creates this meta-narrative and its parody. And this parody becomes the home for the only possible metaphysics, 
absent, negated, but metaphysics nevertheless, right? Or metaphysics as the critique of metaphysics, right? We may call this parodia sacra using the, the, the ancient term, but I would stick with uh, historiographic metafiction. Thank you very much. I can do it. Thank you very much. Sure. Yes, please. Uh, so I, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about the fact that Sharon is not the only person who's um, somehow he's like creating this uh, um, not alternative history, but like almost apologia for the terror. Like I, we, um, you know, like uh, the book of has Afghani, which yeah. seems to make this like, like a similar kind of argument. Um, and it's also very difficult to tell whether it's ironic or serious. Um, and there's then there's also the data who has a similar, like, you know, Chikis as heroes uh, thing, maybe which is more obviously ironic, but still, like, they, there's, like, a, like a trend, um, and I don't know if you could talk about that. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> all right, so, so, so first of all, let's, let, let's be clear that, that uh, Sharov started this trend, if, if, if it's a trend before all um, aforementioned authors, right, and uh, if they are doing similar things, they are doing them after him. Uh, secondly, as I tried to show by all means possible, and uh, as uh, Sharov's uh, biography shows, he cannot justify terror, right? He, uh, he tries to explain terror, but not justify. So he, I, I think it's a very th th thin line here. For him, indeed, uh, terror is the very logical um, part of Russian history, or rather Russian historical meta-narrative, right? Uh, and uh, basically, he blames uh, entire Russian history in terror. If not, no, not that, that's why Stalin for him becomes uh, is, is represented apologetically because he, he just wants to move the responsibility to to, to greater greater um, framework, so to speak. Which, of course, in the context of this uh, very much politicized, uh, still politicized discussion about terror, right? Uh, sounds quite uh, against the grain, I would say. But, but if, let, 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 let me suggest the following mental experiment. Take any of Sharov's novel and place it next to uh, Prilep the Sabiti, right? Which is indeed the justification of the term, right? Uh, and uh, Prilep the Sabiti says, nobody is guilty, everybody is, uh, no, he doesn't say nobody is guilty, he says everybody is guilty. Everybody is guilty, there is no innocence, Everybody deserves to be penalized, and uh, among all these guilty people, the most brilliant ones are those who built Gulag because they had great, great uh, vision for the future of the country. Right? Uh, in 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 Sharov, there are innocent victims. There are there are innocent uh, suffering thousands and millions of people, right? Uh, and 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 the suffering is is very very profound, right? Uh, and at the same time. Uh, people are guilty in, in, in belonging to Russian history, right, and, and, and trying to, to, to drive it as, as, uh, as their fathers and, for, and grandfathers did experience it, right. So it is it's a completely different story, right, it's a completely different level of uh, justification. I don't know if I, if I answered well, but I tried. Yes, I know. I was wondering about all of this in terms of the questions of self and other, and also um, historical tragedy, because it seems to me that everything that's being described here, if you were to transpose it to, say, a discussion of the Holocaust or um, African slavery or the genocide of Native Americans, would just be untenable, um, because it's yes. just about one group doing this to another group. Um, is, is the way that this works the um, the fact that they're not alienating the evil onto a completely other group, but it, it seems like it, it seems like it, uh, it, all of this is a cosmology that justifies a kind of auto cannibalism um, <laughs> on the part of the country, um, which is sort of in parallel to what you see in um, Starokin and in Vainovich, where the auto cannibalism the, the result of that all you have left is shit. Um, but here, instead, you have some sort of strange transcendency. But it seems like it wouldn't work if you were thinking of the tortures as completely some sort of outside other horrible person. Is, it, is, is that involved at all, or am I misreading it? 
Uh, no, you're not misreading it. Uh, and uh, I agree. This so, 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 so his, his constant theme that that uh, if this logic uh, is followed uh, religiously as it is, right, uh, then only executioners survive. It is it is about uh, auto cannibalism exactly because it doesn't create the other. It is sort of the the nation that constantly sort of destroys itself in order to to to, to reach the, the the higher level of transcendence. Uh, transcendence. I'm sorry, uh, and but but my argument is that 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 it is it is the critique of this narrative. It is the critique from the inside. It it, it is easy uh, to imagine this narrative being criticized from outside, as Sorokin would have done. Right? But but what what uh, Sharov tries to do, he tries to bring uh, the reader through this narrative mm -hmm. to make him identify with this narrative, and then sort of challenge to 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 to. To, to criticize it because it is easy to, to, to place oneself outside of it and, and criticize it from outside. He tries to show that no, this narrative is very convincing. Make an effort, uh, as, as, as in this in this quote, and, and and he gives the leads for this effort, but they are not not obvious. So so I I really don't want to 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 serve as the and don't want uh, you to think that the Shiro was the advocate of this narrative, at least not in his novel. It, uh, so so so, and uh, even in his essayism, he's described this narrative as some kind of the I don't know, um, wheel of history, Hegelian wheel of history, which which he can only describe, but he does not uh, approve the way. It. He doesn't justify his plans. Yes, yes. Um, it was really amazing to to listen to Line. Yeah, uh, I, I can about, feel it. <laughs> uh, and if you talk more precisely about the relationship between the Russian messianic narrative in the novels to any, you know, any political utterances or uh, alignments that the biographical uh, Sharok might have made, you know, because usually these, uh, uh, you know, historical writings and his are often proxy battles for contemporary politics. And I'm just wondering whether, um, whether these his historical writings, or rather how they relate to the you know, political stands and, uh, and opinions of the biographical Sharoff. You, know. you, you suggested in his letter to uh, to Atkins' uh, relationship, but I was wondering whether that could be expanded. Um, so, I, I, I think that Ole here can 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 add or correct me uh, if I'm sort of misrepresenting. But but uh, first of all, of course, uh, Sharov was very critical of of current political situation, uh, and uh, as we can can guess, and 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 he was. Uh, of course, very close to. Well, he actually belonged to non-conformist uh, circles in the in the late 70s, early 80s. However, in the in the sort of uh, post-Crimean Russia, he saw the manifestations of the same logic that that that, that he was constantly describing. His argument was that that was what I sort of detected looking back at uh, preaching, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera, comes back comes back and that 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 uh, sort of natural calamity I, I did mention it all but but uh, in his logic it's not only natural calamities that that serve uh, as the sign of God's displacement by the nation it is the, the the constant growth of the country that serves as the proof territorial growth as the proof of the righteousness of the of the leadership right so the, the country has to grow uh, because because it's the righteous country, of course, it's the chosen people, uh, and if it doesn't grow, then it stagnates. So, in in, in this respect, the, the annexation of Crimea and the war in Ukraine and uh, nowadays war in Syria, so they all prove to, to to the fact that Putin's advisors read Sharov and sort of. <laughs> but no, I'm of course I'm kidding. But but but. Uh, Seriously, he, he, he saw that the things are happening over and over again. Uh, Misha Epstein, in the, his, his preface uh, to Sharov's last book of essays, he cites his letter that, that it all returns back to all these uh, boyars, 
uh, ways, so, 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 as, as if modernity hasn't happened. So, so it, it was a very, very, very skeptical view on the progress, but it was a political reaction, of course. How have people read Shadow so far? Have they failed to recognize this critique of the millinerist character of um, the revolutionary discourse that led to the terror? I mean, have people recognized this critique or not? Um, some do, some don't. <laughs> Olya, please help, help me out here. <laughs> Ольга Дунаевская. Я прошу прощения, я буду говорить по-русски, мне просто вот на этот вопрос отчасти хотелось бы ответить. Я спрашивала Володя много раз, что не боится ли он, что люди без чувства скептицизма и иронии, и сарказма, и юмора, в конце концов, что они будут понимать его прямо что ему это нравится, что он это поддерживает, что он, так сказать, об этом пишет всерьез. Он сказал, что он не боится, что он все равно будет писать так, как он пишет, что он никогда не может ориентироваться на читателя какого-то, вот, а пишет всегда для себя, как всякий автор. Но кроме этого он сказал, что это же совершенно очевидно, что если один человек убивает других людей, то он, Володя, не может к нему относиться хорошо, поэтому для него это совершенно очевидно, что, так сказать, тут нет никаких разночтений, не может быть разночтений. Вот, это первое. Второе, в царстве Агамемна, в частности, вот герой, он очень сложный, так сказать, человек, вот Марк сказал об этом, что он и, и подлец, и одновременно отчасти ну, не святой, но во всяком случае претендует на то, чтобы быть учителем справедливости и так далее. И э, Володя отдал ему несколько своих идей, э, которые были ему дороги. И эти идеи, он всегда так делал, он отдавал своим героям какие-то свои мысли, там, не расписанные в эссе или во что-то, но которые он хотел бы сохранить. И вот э, Жестовскому он отдает несколько своих идей, которые, повторяю, были ему дороги, и я его спросила, зачем отдал подлецу э, то, что дорого тебе. Э, и он ответил, что жизнь сложная, и что часто подлец умен и достаточно может думать тонкие какие-то, понимать вещи, и э, тем не менее оставаться подлецом. То есть вот именно вот то, что сказал Марк, так сказать, слух, борьба против эм, простоты жизни за показ ее сложности, вот это было для него очень важно. И во всех революциях, и во всем он, собственно, это декларировал прямо, что вот эта попытка жизнь максимально упростить. И третье тоже, что тоже я возражала против этого и тоже обсуждала это с ним э, в романе, в первом его романе «След вслед». Там, где есть такая маленькая главка «Семейная революция», вот Марк тоже об этом говорил, там, где принимают в семьи, принимают палачи, и палачи становятся членами семей, тех, кого они убили. И тоже я ему сказала, может быть, это уже слишком? И на это он ответил, нет, это не слишком, потому что это наша история. И если у человека убили всю его родню и отца и, и всех, он продолжает кричать «Да здравствует Сталин!», то он это делает, он принимает Сталина в свою семью и, и тех, кто убил его родственников, они приняты в его семью как вот э, родные, как близкие. Ну вот все, что я хотела. Спасибо, спасибо. 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 Any other questions? Do, oh. do you think that he was looking for real explanations? And but uh, my problem with reading him is that it is always kind of his hermetic sources that he really uses only rare postmodernist sources. It's mm -hmm. either it's what, what do you mean by this? Do you think that he really tried to find like uh, answers to what happened? Um, in the course of uh, Soviet history, and uh, put it this way or that way or that way or this way, or, you know what I mean? 
using, um, using only like, okay, Madame de Stahl, but mostly it is like philosophers, uh, Russian uh, religious philosophers, or Russian writers, or etc. That he did not look outside of this um, Russian context. For instance, like uh, this is a sort of a question, I wouldn't say answered, but they answered in a different way in a in a, a social psychology or in a psychoanalytic social psychology, etc. Right? Uh, so, so I, I believe that that. Uh, there are, there are two things that, that he, as I said, he uh, reconstructs the meta-narrative and deconstructs it at the same time. Um, the the, the meta-narrative is about the chosen people and their path to salvation. Right? Uh, the the meta-narrative about the chosen people suggests uh, the religious paradigm and doesn't uh, allow any, any other uh, sort of uh, uh, in, inclusions, right? And uh, uh, the, the very fact of the people being chosen suggests that any other influences, they matter only if they are absorbed by, by this sort of collective destiny. So, so he, he uh, quite uh, consistently restrains himself in this, in this respect, right, in his novels. When you read his essays, he, he, he goes in various directions, and uh, we, we will see, um, I hope when the book is published, uh, the, uh, in, in memoir by, by Georgi Borisov, whom, whom we cited, uh, how he meets him in Paris, right, in Paris, and that he brings him to, to some acquaintances. And uh, the acquaintances are absolutely smitten by, by, by Vladimir Sarodishin, his, his ability to speak about uh, the, 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 this district, uh, the, this uh, part of Paris, uh, this piece of furniture. He, his erudition was immense. That, that was not uh, his, his sort of, in the novels, he sort of created this, this hermetic world. You're absolutely right. But that was his device, so to speak. That, that's what you know, I, I thought about him uh, this um, this um, spring uh, when I was in Nizhny Novgorod, and a driver, cab driver, was uh, driving us to the airport, and uh, we we talked for forty minutes. And this driver told me, "Who do you think that Jesus Christ was?" I said, "Who oh, the Jesus Christ?" He said, "He was Russian." <laughs> and at this moment, I thought about Shalom. Exactly. And, and I thought, why do you think he was Russian? It's just because, you know, somebody gave birth and died during delivery and gave the baby to Virgin Mary. Yeah. And this is how it all happened. Uh, and those, the, the woman who died, she was Russian. Exactly. And I said, excuse me. <laughs> Which means that this phantom uh, so narratives are alive. Mm -hmm. but this is such a perfect. Yeah, it's a great illustration. Thank you. Carol, you want to ask? Я просто хотела спросить Ольгу на ее замечание. Что значит оправдание, когда ничто, вообще ничего не через чур? Как вообще оправдывается? Я не совсем понимаю свой вопрос. So it's probably for me, because I was talking about it. I, I, I think we, we have to, to draw the line between Оправдание объяснение, justification explanation. He never justifies, but he tries to explain. Uh, and and uh, the, 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 this lack of justification, or rather condemnation, is expressed not directly, not not, not in a sort of Sorokin style or even Pilevin style, but but from underneath, through 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 very sort of subtle ways of deconstruction. And and in this way, it it, it has its very powerful effect because it's sort of it, it makes you swallow the bait and then then, then, then to suffer from it, right? Uh, it's, it, 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 it's what we may call negative uh, pedagogy, uh, something like that. It's, it, it's not what we used to. It's a different method of dealing with the reader. Uh, and what, what, what Ola told us, it's, it, it's, and it's exactly, it's about complexity. It's, about, mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. too easy to, to, to make the, 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 the bastards their the mirrors. Of course they are. But they are driven by, by, by the beautiful uh, transcendental goal. Yes, so in that sense, it's exactly like his appreciation of Platonov Absolutely. as being an insider to the revolution. There's lots of ways of being for and against a revolution, but if you experience it painfully from the inside, you have an entirely different view and an entirely different right to judgment. Yeah. And, and, and uh, if, if when, when you read uh, 
and again, Oli knows more about this, uh, about his family, which I, I intentionally inserted this quotation, but almost all his family sort of perish in Gulag, right? His father, who was constantly sort of living a tragically double life, a, a person who, who whose parents were, were killed, and he was writing quite, quite, of course, positive Soviet journalism and, and romantic fairy tales. Uh, and uh, so, so, so th 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 this uh, very, very traumatic experience, which, which, which Vladimir always sort of had with himself, right? And he, he never separated himself from, from the family. It was very, very, very important for his own sort of self-construction, right? And uh, um, th that's why he constantly returns to, to, to these issues. If, if they wouldn't be painful, he wouldn't return, right? Uh, so. I have another question. I'm wondering if you could comment on <coughs> Dostoevsky in connection with Shadow. A number of things that you said in your talk made me think about Dostoevsky um, the whole time. You you spoke of Shadow's uh, writing history on a deeper level, and of course I thought of Dostoevsky's realism in a higher sense. and. Um, one of the quotes on parody was from Tinyana von Gogol and Dostoevsky. And I'm just wondering, because if Dostoevsky in some ways gives a model for the kind of parody that you see in Shadow, isn't he also um, sort of guilty of promoting the idea, the messianic idea of Russia? I mean, is, is Dostoevsky a figure who's important for Shadow's thinking on these subjects or not, and for his for his style, and formally, is there an engagement with the Dostoevsky? It's a great idea that, 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 that this parody, uh, Parodia Sacra, is, is in many ways informed by Dostoevsky. I didn't think about this, but it makes perfect sense. Uh, it, it is quite obvious that, that for Sharov, Gogol was more important than Dostoevsky. Uh, he returns to Gogol constantly, and he has uh, d uh, definite parallelism between Gogol, Mayor Kovalev, and himself, and his date of birth, and so, so there is a very complicated uh, story there. Uh, and of course, in Vazvashenia uh, Vigibit, Return to Egypt, he depicts absolutely fictional uh, descendants of Gogol who who are continuing uh, Dusha and writing the third volume of Dusha about Pavel Ivan Shichikov, who becomes the, the leader of uh, Bigunil of, of the sect, right? Um, so, 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 Gogol, Gogol overshadows Dostoevsky, here. but but Dostoevsky definitely is present there, and and I think that that you are right that Dostoevsky is indeed uh, sort of uh, 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 responsible for the messianic thinking on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, Dostoevsky gives examples of of criticism of revolutionaries as messianic thinkers, sort of thinking in different way. For instance, in uh, the last novel um, in uh, Sarsva Gambana, he uses, uh, um, he, 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 he depicts a real character, Gavril uh, Misnikov, the one who killed uh, Mikhail Romanov. Uh, and, and later was, uh, later escaped the Soviet Union, then returned to the Soviet Union, was, was executed, etc. So he created the entire narrative around uh, Mikhail, uh, Gavril Misnikov. And uh, he cites his book and sort of uh, develops a lot about it for him, for Misnikov. The main sort of the proto-revolutionary was Smirnikov. Smirnikov is the proto-revolutionary, is the one who sort of dares to do what, what any revolution has to do. Right, so, 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 but, but uh, obviously Smirnikov is not the favorite character of Dostoevsky, uh, and it's not uh, Alyosha, right, it's, it's Smirnikov. So, so in this respect, he certainly solidarizes with Dostoevsky, right, so, so, and it is a very interesting issue, and uh, it requires, I would say, much more, much more attention, but, but some of, 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 of uh, Sharov's, especially inserted novels, right, uh, they, they, they sound, as a reverse also uh, in, in, in dialogical relations with, with Dostoevsky's text. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, in Doeva in, in there, there is this inserted novella about uh, two rabbis who in 11th century uh, has invented uh, uh, the story about Jewish guilt in uh, murdering of Christ. And so why did they do this? 
in order to justify, in, in the very same way as, as Rostovsky justifies the suffering, justifies the horrors they were undergoing from Christians. These horrors were not justified by anything at all. And therefore, they, they, they just invented their guilt to, 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 to add teleology, which, which made it at least explainable, if not tolerable. Right? Uh, and, and I think that, 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 that that's a strange inversion of the legend of the, of the great inquisitor, where, where the inquisitor provides teleology right? so to, 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 to something that cannot be justified. Right? So, so, so he, 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 Dostoevsky is indeed in his orbit. That's, that's I think, is quite clear. So it is 4.30, but if we have one more question, maybe we could sneak it in, <laughs> or we could conclude maybe and thank Professor Letterman. Thank you.